The Peter Schiff Show. The Dow Jones is now falling for its third consecutive day, down 280 points today, 27,502 spot 81 is where uh, it closed. Off the lows, we were down better than 450 points earlier in the day. And in fact, yesterday's 200 point plus drop, uh, I think we closed right near the lows of the day. So a pretty weak take technically yesterday. And again, follow through today. We'll see what happens uh, in the days and weeks ahead. Uh, December is typically a very strong month. In fact, I think it's the strongest month of the year historically for the U.S. stock market. And you get the Santa Claus rally. Well, maybe the Grinch is going to steal that rally this year and we could have a weak December. Now, I know some people think, oh, maybe Trump wants the market to come down in December so we can have a bigger gain uh, next year, which is an election year. Remember, the reason the stock market is up so much this year is because last December was the worst December since uh, the Great Depression. Depression. Now, I don't know if this December could take out that one, but hey, it's possible given the fact that there's no reason for the stock market to be up where it is, right? The only reason the stock market has gone up, I think, is because of the Fed. I mean, some of it may be because of all of the teasing about a trade deal, but I think the big uh, factor has been the Fed and the Powell put. And really, what the Powell put was was the Fed's assurance that under no circumstances would it consider raising interest rates. That it doesn't even matter what happens to inflation, that inflation can go up, right? We can have higher inflation, and they wouldn't even think about raising rates. So the only thing that can happen to rates is that they are either cut or they remain the same. So the threat of higher interest rates, taking that completely off the table, really emboldened the bulls. It's like waving a flag at a bull, like a red flag, and now they come charging because the the element of fear now is gone that, oh, there's going to be some kind of surprise rate hike. And in fact, when they see stronger economic data, not that we get much stronger economic data, most of the data we get is weaker than expected. But every once in a while, we get something that's stronger, and the markets are not reacting to that with any kind of fear because they know it doesn't really matter what the data is. uh, The Fed is not going to hike rates. And in fact, when it comes to inflation, I read an article, I forget it was Financial Times or Wall Street Journal or who broke the story, but it had to do with basically the Fed really codifying its new mandate on letting inflation run hot. I mean, I've been talking about this. The Fed has been talking about it because every time Um, Powell speaks, he talks about symmetrical inflation. And I basically said, well, what that means is inflation above 2% by an equal amount that it used to be below 2%. But now you actually have the Fed talking about adopting that officially into their mandate about having inflation run above 2%, adjusting their target north, right? So that the official target now is above 2%. And the reason that they have to increase the target, and they didn't really say to what, maybe 3%, maybe 3 and a half. I'm not really sure where. But the idea is we have to make up for the lack of inflation in the past. Because since the Fed has a 2% target, well, if we have five years at 1%, well, then we have to have five years at 3%, or maybe three years at 4 or 5%, whatever it is, to get the average to be 2%, right? So this is going to be their new policy. So we have to let inflation run hotter than 2% in order to bring the average up to 2% because we have all these years where we were below 2%. Now, of course, I've been saying for years on this podcast, in fact, even before I did the podcast, back in the days of uh, the Peter Schiff radio show, uh, I said that this was going to happen, that the Fed was eventually going to have to increase its 2% inflation target because it has no choice because it couldn't enforce the target without collapsing the economy. That they would bark when it comes to fighting inflation, but they would never bite. 
And in fact, the irony of this is, you know, they rig the CPI. They go to the CPI and they say, oh, you know, the CPI is overstating inflation, right? So they say, oh, yeah, it's overstating it. So we need to redo it so that we get a more honest number. And of course, they meant they were going to fix it to get a dishonest number because they wanted to underreport inflation. Uh, just like, you know, the mafia, of course, if you hire the mafia to, to uh, go out there and do a survey of crime to decide whether or not we need more police, well, the mafia is going to come back and say, hey, there's no crime. We don't need any more cops. Look, there's hardly any crime out there, right? So the government wants to create inflation, but the last thing they want is the official measures to reveal it. So they went and they doctored it up and they found a way to engineer the CPI so that a lot of the price hikes don't actually show up. So now that they've rigged the CPI, to understate inflation. Now they complain, oh, we don't have enough inflation. Look, inflation is so low. The Fed needs to do something about it. The Fed needs to create more inflation. So I said this was coming. And I also said that they were going to try to justify it in the manner that they are, but that it was all BS, which it is. Because if you go back to the initial justification for the uh, 2% target, right? The reason the Fed said we need inflation of 2% is because if we let inflation go to a half a percent, right? 1%, a half a percent, that's too close to zero. And since deflation is supposedly so terrible, right? The worst thing that can happen to the consumer is he gets to buy something for less money than he paid the year before, right? That's the worst thing. We can't have the cost of living going down. It has to go up, but it only has to go up a little, right? We 2% is a little, but if it goes up a half a percent, that's not quite enough because if it's only going up half a percent, what if the economy weakens and instead of prices going up half a percent, they go down half a percent, right? That's a complete disaster. That's economic Armageddon as far as the Fed is concerned. And they're so worried that prices might go down that they needed a buffer, right? We need a safety zone just to make sure we don't step on that deflation uh, rail, right? We, have, we, we need to have enough of a gap between zero and positive inflation as an insurance policy, right? That's what they said. And they also kind of said, look, you know, if we ever have to, uh, you know, stimulate the economy by cutting rates, uh, if inflation is too low when we start the cuts, we won't really have enough room uh, to cut rates. And, and so in order to preserve the Fed's ability to micromanage the economy, American consumers have to suffer a larger increase in their cost of living because it's worth it, right? The extra cost, the extra price that Americans are going to pay every year for the goods that they need and the services they need, it's worth paying a little extra just so we can preserve uh, the Federal Reserve's ability to micromanage the economy and to get us out of the recessions that it creates, right? So that's, that was what they were saying. But think about this, and I've mentioned this before, but again, I got to mention it again. This is absurd. If we had a year, if the year is already in the past, right, let's say we go through 2019, right, this whole year ends, and it turns out that inflation averaged 1.5%, right? Well, okay, we, we dodged the deflation bullet. We don't need to make up for it by having 2.5% inflation next year. I mean, what's the point of that, right? If we had 1% inflation in 2018, why do we need to make up for that? Right? We, we, we avoided deflation. Right? That's a good thing. See, the Fed didn't say that prices going up by 1% are bad. It just said that it wanted to make sure that 2%, because that would give a bigger buffer, because 1% was too close to zero, which is where we can't be. But if we finish the whole year and we didn't slip into the dreaded deflation zone, okay, great. Now let's go on to the next year. Why do we have to make up for that? Right? This is nonsense. The Fed is basically saying, hey, you guys, consumers, your cost of living didn't go up enough in the last few years. It went up, but not quite enough. So what we have to do is make sure that in the future, the cost of living goes up even faster, like a lot more than we initially would have planned, because we have to catch up. Right? We have to make sure that we make up for the fact that your cost of living didn't go up enough in the past by making sure your cost of living goes up even more in the future. I mean, what kind of asinine policy is that? Right? But Wall Street 
buys it, the public buys it, the media buys it, the Fed comes out and says, we need to make up for past low inflation. And everybody says, sure, that makes sense, right? Yeah, the Fed has to stick to 2%. It makes no sense whatsoever unless you understand the truth. The truth is the Fed wants to prop up the economy, the bubble, not the real economy. It wants to monetize debt. It wants to prevent the market from raising interest rates. It wants to prevent asset prices from collapsing. It wants to prevent the government from having to cut spending or having to deal with its debt. So in order to kind of paper over all these problems so they can keep kicking the can down the road, that's the reason why we need more inflation. We don't need it because it's good for us. It's only good for the government in maintaining the bubble, to maintain the illusion that the economy is okay when it's actually imploding. So this is exactly what I've been warning was going to happen, and now you're seeing it play out. And in fact, you know, as far as I'm concerned, my level of confidence on my being right, on the big picture, on my being right in my investment strategy has probably never been higher than it is now. I mean, so many things that I've been saying for years and years and years are happening exactly the way I said they would happen for the precise reason. Sure, the stock market, you know, has uh, gone up more than I thought and the dollar has, you know, been more resilient than I thought. But again, a lot of that had to do with my overestimating the intelligence of everybody else to figure out what I already knew. In fact, the same thing happened. I remember when we were doing the subprime short, uh, one of the concerns that I had about that trade and why I, you know, I didn't go all in on it. I mean, I put it on, but I didn't go all in on it. Uh, and I still, you know, I, I had a bunch of gold stocks that obviously I could have sold those back then and just shorted more subprime. But one of the concerns I had for the subprime short was that the housing bubble was so big and the problem was so obvious. I thought that the Federal Reserve would be able to see it sooner. My fear on the subprime short was that because the collapse was going to be so big and the recession so great and the financial crisis so great, right? And I saw this coming in 05 and 06, right? Because I saw it so clearly, I thought the Fed would see it too. And that before everything imploded, right, the Fed would try to preemptively stop it from happening. The Fed could actually see, right, read these tea leaves and it would slash interest rates before the market crashed, that it would actually start printing money and buying up mortgages to try to artificially suppress rates and to prop up the subprime market. I was afraid that the Fed was going to do that, right? That the Fed would be smart enough to understand how bad the crisis would be and it would act preemptively to prevent the crisis. And if they did that, well, then they might have propped up the subprime market at the expense of just killing the dollar. And so I wanted to make sure I still had my gold tr stocks and things like that. I didn't want to go all in on this trade. Well, it turns out I was wrong in thinking anyone at the Fed had any intelligence enough to see this thing coming. I mean, this train wreck was so obvious. I saw it from a mile away, yet even when they were just a few feet away, uh, they still didn't see it. And they let the whole thing implode before they came in. And so I was wrong to think that the guys at the Fed were smart enough to see this problem before it completely blew up in their faces, right? So, you know, this has been something that has consistently, you know, confounded me. I, I look at things, I look at problems, and I just assume that other people will figure them out. They don't until it's too late. They never figure it out. I mean, you know, they just get completely surprised by what happened. But I actually have a higher degree of confidence that my current investment strategy will work out than I actually did about my subprime short, which obviously worked out very, very well. Uh, but I think this is going to work out even better when this whole thing implodes and the dollar collapses uh, and, uh, you know, the U.S. bond market collapses, this whole economy, this economic crash that I wrote about back in my book, uh, Crash Proof, How to Profit from the Coming Economic Collapse, the book that came out in 2007. And could you believe it? It's almost 2020 now. We're almost on a next decade, almost into the 20s. Uh, I did not realize uh, that back then that the crash that I was writing about wouldn't happen until the 20s. But as it turns out, that's probably the way it's going to be. A much longer lag than I originally expected, but a much bigger payoff financially for me and I think clients who are pursuing this strategy, but unfortunately far worse for the country. And as I said many times, this wave of socialism that is building in the country couldn't have happened at a worse time.
You know, at least if you believe in capitalism, if you believe in socialism, it couldn't happen at a better time because the economy is going to completely implode and the socialists are going to be able to blame capitalism and kind of ride to the rescue on a right horse. And of course, they're not going to rescue anybody. They're just going to uh, complete uh, the destruction of the economy. Anyway, I want to get back to what I started talking about before I digressed a few times into these other topics about the market going down. And again, why did the market go down today? Why did it go down yesterday? Well, a lot of it started with trade. Over the weekend, there were some stories uh, you know, coming out of China that the Chinese basically said, look, we're not going to do a phase one deal. And of course, a phase one deal isn't really a deal. It's just like an agreement to continue to dis- negotiate to get a real agreement, right? It was just a, a face-saving cosmetic uh Uh, deal because Trump couldn't actually deliver the comprehensive deal he had been promising. So all of a sudden he starts talking about phase one and the markets are are fine with that. Uh, But now the Chinese are saying, look, we're not even doing a phase one BS deal until all the tariffs are removed that you have there. And of course, Trump can't do that. He can't remove all the tariffs. First of all, he keeps telling everybody the tariffs are great. We're taking in all this money from China, which is BS. In fact, even the Federal Reserve did a study and they showed that the prices of Chinese imports have barely changed uh, from before the tariff to where they are now. I mean, maybe they're off a percent or two, which means that the Chinese are not paying the tariffs because the prices are the same as they were before the tariffs, which means that tariffs are added to the the price. And so Americans are paying the tariffs one way or another. It's not the Chinese, right? Uh, But if Trump is telling all the American public, hey, we're getting all this money from China, well, why get rid of the tariffs, right? The tariffs also are his only leverage, right? That's how he's supposedly going to beat the Chinese into submission and force them to a great deal for the United States. So if he gets rid of all the tariffs, based on nothing, based on a BS phase one deal that accomplishes nothing, I mean, that's not going to look very good. So as soon as they're doing that, as soon as the Chinese are saying, hey, we need no tariffs or we're not going to even do a phase one deal, you pretty much know, if you didn't already know from listening to my podcast, that there's not going to be a phase one deal. So the markets were already a little nervous about that. I think that might be why we, we sold off the last couple of days. But then what happened... Uh, This morning is Trump was given a speech, I think, in Europe, and he's given a press conference. And he basically says, uh, first of all, he goes, the only way there's going to be a trade deal with China is if I want to make a deal, right? As if it's all up to him, right? Whether or not there's a deal is completely up to Trump, right? The Chinese have no say. If I want a deal, we're going to get one. If I don't, we won't. And you know what? I'm not even sure I want one is basically what he said. And then what he told these reporters was, you know, he thinks we'd be better off waiting until after the election to have a trade deal, a phase one deal, not even the actual deal, just a BS phase one deal. We can't even get that until Trump's second term, right? I guess that's going to be his, uh, you know, reelection campaign. Hey, if you can reelect me, we're going to have the greatest deal with China ever, right? I couldn't deliver one on my first term. I had four years and I couldn't do jack on a deal with China. But if you give me a second term, well, that guarantees we're going to have the greatest deal ever. So that's why you have to vote for me, because the only way you're going to get this great deal is if I'm reelected, because if I'm not reelected, we're going to have a lousy deal. We're going to have no real deal at all. And the Chinese are going to keep taking advantage of us. Now, I'm sure some of the voters will buy that BS, but the problem for the market now is now Trump is saying there's no trade deal until after the election. That's a year away. That's a year from now. (laughs) So people thought we were going to have a trade deal any day, right? In fact, CNBC had uh, uh, Jeremy Siegel on, you know, who's a popular guest. He's on a lot. And Jeremy Siegel is talking about this problem. He's on there and he's saying, you know, up until now, We all thought, everybody thought the deal was going to happen any day, that phase one deal was imminent, and it was just a question of, you know, when it happens. And now the markets are worried that, hey, maybe we're not going to get this deal. Now, Jeremy Siegel is saying everybody thought this. Who's everybody? I mean, the the guests on CNBC, is that everybody? The CNBC anchors? I mean, maybe they're the only fools that actually bought this nonsense. Yeah, if you only get your news from CNBC, If that's your source of financial use, yeah, maybe you were under the false impression that we were going to get a trade deal with China or a phase one deal. But, I mean, if you listen to my podcast, what have I been saying the whole time, going back from the beginning, that I didn't think we were going to get a deal? It was all BS. And if we ever even got a deal, it would be nothing. It would be cosmetic, but that we probably couldn't even get that. I've been saying that Trump doesn't actually want a deal because then he would would deliver a deal that 
didn't you know deliver on his promises right he wanted to keep selling the rumor and never actually have the fact you know you have a lot of these people out there that are saying well you know if it wasn't for this trade war the Dow would be much higher than it is I actually think it's the reverse I think the trade war has been good for the stock market right because people want to be in the stock market when the war ends so the longer the war is waging the longer people are going to be betting on the outcome because people think, oh, as soon as we have a resolution, the market's going to go up. So people keep buying the rumor, buying the rumor, buying the rumor, waiting to sell the fact. And we never get a fact. It's all rumor because there is no fact because the rumors are actually lies. That is the problem. And of course, you know, but CNBC viewers, they don't they don't know what I'm saying because they banned me from CNBC years ago. So if you want to actually know what's happening, you got to listen to my podcast. You can't get your news uh, from the conventional uh, media where it's all whitewashed, right? It's all the same perspective and it's all it's all wrong. In fact, Mark Faber also, I saw him today, was interviewing uh, Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross, right? And basically asking him uh, if he regretted, you know, the promises that Trump made earlier in the year about the, uh, the trade deal. Because if you remember, when phase one trade deal was first announced, it was October 11th, I think was the date that that happened. And before that date, Nobody ever heard phase one. It was always trade deal, trade deal. There was never any talk of a phase one. Then all of a sudden, Trump comes out and says, we've completed phase one. The phase one deal is done, right? We have uh, concluded negotiations. We have come to a deal. We have this great phase one deal. It's already done. It's in the bag, right? We've already agreed to it in principle. All we need is the formalities of putting it on paper. We're going to have a big signing ceremony, and it's all going to be done. Oh, and by the way, Trump said, this is the greatest deal ever for American farmers. They have never had a deal this great. Go out and buy some more tractors. You know, load up. I don't even know if we can fill this order. It's so big. It's the biggest order in the history of agriculture. He was saying it's a good thing farmers didn't go out and and, and buy new equipment based on Trump's uh, phony promises. But in any event, Faber asked Ross, do, do you regret this? Do you, do, you know, do you think Trump shouldn't have come out and said that? And he goes, no, we don't regret it. Of course, why should he regret it? Right? The, Dow was, the Dow rose by 1,600 points uh, following uh, that comment. Right? That comment sparked all sorts of more comments about the deal is eminent any day, any week. We're going to sign it here. Right? Buy the rumor, buy the rumor, buy the rumor. Right? And they just pushed the market all the way up. The Dow went through 28,000 on all that BS. So why should Wilbur Ross regret that when the comments worked? Because I said a long time ago, Trump is not talking to the Chinese. He's not negotiating. Because if he was, he's the worst negotiator ever. You ought to read the art of the deal, right? Because what he's saying makes no sense if you're trying to negotiate. The only way Trump's statements make any sense is if they're really designed to boost the stock market. He's not talking to the Chinese. He's talking to the algos, right? He's talking to the traders. He's trying to get them to bid uh, the the spoos higher. That's what he's doing, right? I've been saying that all along. That's why he doesn't want a deal. He just wants to keep the prospect of the deal alive for as long as possible. Now he wants to keep it alive for another year. Right. Not only to hopefully keep the stock market going up, but to increase his chances of getting reelected, because just like he's dangling the prospects of a great trade deal that he's never going to get in front of Wall Street right, and investors, he wants to dangle the same thing in front of voters. And of course, also. Uh, Based on these BS uh, promises of a trade deal, and we get all these record highs in the Dow, oh, that gives Trump something to tweet about every day. Look at the new record. Thank thank, thank your president. Aren't you richer? Go spend all your money. Merry Christmas. You know, taking credit uh, for every uptick in the stock market. As I said, the credit really goes to the Fed, or actually the blame, because I don't want to credit the Fed for inflating a bubble. I want to blame them for doing it, because you don't give somebody credit for doing something bad. You blame them. What is happening now is actually bad, because the stock market bubble is not a good thing, because it's phony. It encourages malinvestment and excesses, and all bubbles pop, and when they do, you get a crisis. So the Fed is not doing us a favor. Now, there are people who are making money off of what the Fed is doing, or they think they're making money. Now, some people will actually make money because they'll sell before the collapse or they'll be short, but the vast majority of people are going to get wiped out. Their paper profits are going to turn into real losses. That's why I keep saying when it comes to investing, you never count your chickens before they hatch because most people, right, they think they have a bunch of chickens, but all they have is a bunch of rotten eggs. 
in addition to tweeting about the you know record highs in the stock market, if you look at some of Trump's recent tweets, a lot of them have just been bashing not only the Fed, but bashing the dollar, right? The, the opposite of a strong dollar policy. I've never seen a president who was so critical of the value of the dollar and wanting the dollar to go down and urging the Federal Reserve to take actions to weaken the dollar, saying that other countries are debasing their currencies, devaluing their currencies, and they are getting an advantage, and we need to match that. We need to make our currency weaker than our competitors so we can have a better advantage. We need to win the race to the bottom. That is basically what Donald Trump is saying. I've never heard this. It's not just criticizing Fed policy, but he's criticizing the dollar. He wants a weaker dollar, and one of his main criticisms of the Fed is that their policies have the dollar too strong that we need different policies to have a weaker dollar, right? The opposite of what used to go on, you know, back in the Rubin days uh, with Bill Clinton, King Dollar. In fact, King Dollar is Mr. Larry Kudlow. You know, if Larry Kudlow was still a private citizen and Donald Trump were a Democrat and he was saying exactly what he's saying now, right? If Obama was saying when he was president, exactly what Trump is saying now, one of his biggest critics on television would be Larry Kudlow. But since he's just a, you know, a hacker at this point uh, for Trump and the Republicans, well, now all of a sudden what Trump is saying is great. But I guarantee you, if Trump loses and we have a Democratic president in 2021 who says the same thing, well, Kudlow is going to be right back and criticizing it. But of course, what credibility is the guy going to have uh, when he doesn't criticize uh, Trump, but then criticizes his Democratic successor for basically saying the same stuff, for pursuing the same the same policy. But, you know, Donald Trump is wrong. See, he has this idea that you get an advantage when you weaken your currency, that the way to strengthen your exports and your economy is to have the weakest currency. That is wrong. You know, if you look historically, the countries that have had the, the strongest economies with the biggest exports have been countries that had strong currencies. Look at what happened to West Germany with the Deutschmark, right? The Deutschmark was very, very strong, and Germany's exports were booming at the same time. Same thing with Japan, the yen. When the yen was very, very strong for decades, going up and up and up, so, so were Japan's exports. You see, a strong currency really helps your economy and helps your exports. Here's why it does that. First of all, if you have a strong currency, you have naturally low interest rates, right? Because you have low inflation, and so your capital costs are lower when you can borrow in a strong currency. And that is an advantage to entrepreneurs in that country because capital is a big component of the cost of doing business. You have to borrow to finance capital investment. And if you're borrowing in a sound currency, you get a lower rate of interest. If you have a really weak currency, your capital costs go up. Creditors demand higher interest to be compensated for the loss of purchasing power. So that's number one. Number two, if you have a sound currency, right, well, your employees aren't constantly demanding raises because their cost of living isn't going up because you have low inflation. Or maybe you even have deflation. Maybe consumer prices are falling in a really strong economy. And so your real wages are rising, even though you have, don't have to increase them in a nominal level. But more important than keeping your wage costs down, if you have a strong currency, you keep your raw material costs down, especially imported raw materials, right? If you're importing a lot of raw materials and then manufacturing, right? If your currency is stronger, the cost of importing those resources gets lower and lower and lower. That makes you more competitive. Also, a lot of domestic manufacturers uh, import uh, components uh, from foreign suppliers. And if you have a strong currency, that reduces the cost of your uh, components that you're importing. So a strong currency is good for an economy. A strong currency leads to more competitive uh, businesses and greater exports. And again, if you look historically, the countries that have been the worst, they've had the worst economies, they've been, they have weak currencies. That's what they all have in common. They have weak currencies, they have high inflation, then they have high interest rates. So you do not debase your way to prosperity. You debase your way to poverty. Donald Trump doesn't know his ass from a hole in the wall when it comes to this subject. Either that or he's just talking, right? He's just saying stuff that he thinks his base is going to like. But this is all a bunch of nonsense. But again, Larry Kudlow would be one of the biggest critics of Trump 
if Trump wasn't a Republican or maybe even if he wasn't his economic advisor in the White House. Remember, I said this in the beginning when Trump first appointed Kudlow. Again, I said this on my podcast. A lot of people were saying at the time, oh, you know, Kudlow is going to move Trump away from protectionism. He's going to move him away from some of these ideas and he's going to have some influence on the president. I said it was going to be just the opposite. I said Trump was going to have influence over Kudlow. And one of the reasons I think Trump wanted Kudlow in the White House was that old adage about keeping your, your friends close, but your enemies closer. Because Kudlow was an enemy, right? He was criticizing Trump, but by bringing him into the White House, he can silence that criticism and turn him into an advocate. And that's really what he did. And so, you know, Kudlow completely swallowed his pride and just, you know, basically, uh, abandoned whatever principles he had and and just became a a, a mouthpiece for Donald Trump. And that's exactly what I said was going to happen. Again, that's another prediction that I completely hit the nail on the head. Now, I want to uh, switch gears a little bit and talk about politics. You know, uh, first of all, you know, Bloomberg is in the race. I commented about that. But I think, you know, one of the the things that's going to really hit Bloomberg hard now is, you know, he gave an interview, I don't know, it was like a year or two ago, uh, talking about, you know, the, the the soda tax, the sugar tax they had in New York City. And he was talking about how you use the tax code to influence behavior, which, of course, you do, right? Whenever you tax something, you get less of it, right? When you subsidize something, you get more of it. That's basic economics. I mean, a lot of politicians forget to think about the impact that taxes have on behavior, which is why a lot of these policies, right, taxes never raise as much revenue as they think, and programs always cost a lot more than they think because people's behavior changes as a result of the taxes uh, where people try to avoid them or the subsidies where people try to qualify for them. And so Bloomberg is talking about how when people are poor, it's a lot easier to influence them, let's say, with a sales tax than rich people. Because if you're rich and you put a tax on something, I mean, if you're rich, you're really not going to care about the price because you have plenty of money. And just, you know, buying things, uh, consumer goods, you know, beverages or food, it doesn't really matter whether it costs an extra 10 or 20 percent. You're still going to buy it. But if you're poor, right, and taxes jack up the price by 10 or 20 percent, that could have a real Uh, impact on your behavior. It could alter your decision. And so what basically he's saying is we need to tax poor people because then uh, they'll live longer. Because what he's talking about is that he's saying poor people are too dumb to make their own decisions about what's healthy or not. And so I'm going to make the decision for them as mayor because I'm smarter than they are. And so for their own good, I'm going to put this tax on, on, on sugary drinks. And now because I taxed them and made them more expensive, right, Economics says that, well, poor people will now buy fewer of these sugary drinks because I increased the price and therefore I decrease the demand. And now they're going to live longer, right? So I use the tax code, right, to get people to do the right thing when absent the taxes, they would have done the wrong thing because they're poor and they're stupid is basically what he's saying, although he didn't say that. But that's exactly what the ads are going to say that his Democratic challengers run against him. They're going to be able to put a soundbite of uh, Bloomberg saying, we need to tax the poor. It's good to tax the poor, right? And, 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 and I mean, can you imagine that commercial? Here's this billionaire, right? The richest person or the, one of the richest people in the world, he's got $50 billion. And what does he want to do? He wants to tax the poor, right? The poor have too much money. Let's tax them. I mean, that's an actual soundbite. It doesn't matter how much he wants to walk that back. You put that in a commercial, you put that in a bumper sticker. How are you going to win the Democratic primary? It's going to be very, very tough for Bloomberg uh, to win, given that soundbite that his, uh, his adversaries now have. I mean, I don't think that soundbite is nearly as damaging in the general election. In fact, I don't think it'll be damaging at all. Where it does the most harm is in uh, the Democratic primary. And of course, that's where it is going to be used. Again, as I said in my last podcast, he is by far the best candidate uh, in the Democratic field, uh, which is probably why he, he won't win. <laughs> But anyway, also, I wanted to talk about Elizabeth Warren's latest uh, plan to destroy jobs. Right. I mean, I mean, at least Elizabeth Warren is consistent. Right. Again, she's consistently wrong on everything she wants to do. So you got to respect that. But she's got this fair work week plan. Right. Fairness. Right. They always want to talk about fairness, although when something is fair, 
it's when it's voluntary, right? When the government wants to order something, right, wants to force an employer to provide something to an employee that he wouldn't ordinarily provide in a free, fair negotiation, it's not fair. So it's really not the work fairness plan. It's the work unfairness plan, right? Because the government wants to impose this requirement on people against their will. What's fair about that? There's nothing fair, right? It, this is cheating. This is the opposite of fairness. But basically what she's saying is that people who work part-time, she's saying this is terrible because sometimes, you know, they don't really know what their schedule is, right? And sometimes their bosses, you know, give them their schedule last minute and it's kind of inconvenient. And this is really not fair, right, for people to have a, a work schedule sprung on them last minute. So here's what the law is going to require, right? Anybody who employs more than 15 people, you need to tell your employees two weeks in advance what their schedule is going to be right and then if you veer from that because you know there's some change in the business all of a sudden maybe you know you have a big if you're a restaurant and all of a sudden you have a big you know party that comes and you're going to be really busy if you need to change the schedule around you have to compensate your employee for the inconvenience of changing their schedule now i'm not really sure how much the compensation is going to be i mean what the government's going to set but this is her plan right now this of course sounds great to all the people who are working part-time. Oh yeah, that would be great if I always knew my schedule in advance. Oh yeah, that would make my life easier if my boss couldn't just give me last minute schedules. And oh yeah, if he has to pay me a penalty, if he wants to change my hours, oh, that's great, right? All this free stuff for me, right? Because a lot of these people aren't smart enough to actually understand what this means. Because what it means is lower wages and fewer employment opportunities. That's all it means. First of all, number one, again, so Elizabeth Warren says, if you have more than 15 employees. So right away, uh-oh, okay, I got to stay under 15 employees if I don't want to be subjected to this nonsense. So if I have 16 employees, I got to fire, I got to fire too, right? You know, if I have 14 employees, I can't hire any, right? So number one, okay, let's cap my, my workforce at 14 people so I don't have to deal with this BS, right? Uh, because a lot of businesses may not be able to know a schedule two weeks in advance. They may have to adjust their schedules uh, with a shorter notice. But of course, if employees do not like uh, schedules that can be changed abruptly or if they're not going to know their schedule uh, until, you know, like the Sunday night, they get it and they have the schedule for the next week or whatever it is. If they don't like a job like that, then they can quit and find another job. I mean, you know, employers have to compete with employees in a free market. And so there could be some employers that say, yeah, we're going to give you your schedule two weeks in advance. And there could be other employers that say, you know, I'm not going to know your schedule to the last minute. Now, maybe that employer, in order to attract people uh, to fill those jobs, based on the less you know, convenience of not knowing your precise schedule, maybe he'll have to pay a little bit more. But let the free market sort that out. But the minute you have the government coming in with a one-size-fits-all, you got to do this. Every business has to give the schedules to their workers two weeks in advance, and if they can't do it, they have to pay a penalty for altering the hours. Well, what that means is now a lot of businesses have incentives to hire fewer people, right, to automate, right, so they can have machines doing stuff instead of people because then they don't have to deal with this, or to outsource, to try to have other companies, maybe in other country, have labor there, right, especially to, if, let's say you have, you have certain people that you need to schedule. Let's say I've got 20 employees, but there's only five or six that are on, that are, you know, part-time that have these schedules that I have to adjust abruptly, right? Well, let's say I can't fire those people, but what I do is I fire six or seven other people who aren't like doing customer service work that are doing back office work or something like that. I fire those people to get underneath the 15. And instead, I, you know, I outsource it and I have some people in India doing that or something else so I can continue to have uh, my employees uh, on a more flexible schedule because now I have fewer than 15 employees because I'm outsourcing. Businesses are going to find a way to reduce their headcount and to hire fewer uh, employees. And of course, to the extent that they can't do that and they have to have employees and they have and they and they have to, uh, you know, schedule them two weeks in advance and they're and they know they're going to get penalized when they have to make adjustments, which they know they're going to have to do. Well, then they're going to have to factor those penalties into wages and they're going to have to lower the wages so that when you add the wage and the penalty, you get back to the same place. Right. So this is all nonsense. It's all a politician peddling something for nothing, 
right? And the voters eating it up because they don't know any better. This is the, the big problem with democracy. This, again, is why the founding fathers worked so hard to save us <laughs> from uh, the evils, the tyranny that is uh, brought by democracy. You know, too, too, while I'm on this subject of, um, you know, employers and, and these risks about employing people, you know, I was reading this article about this billionaire. This a guy is like a, a California um, producer. He's in the entertainment industry, a billionaire. I forget the guy's name. Uh, it's not that important. But anyway, um, he just lost his sexual harassment lawsuit, and he got hit with like $54 million dollars. In, in damages to the woman that he allegedly uh, assaulted. Now, of course, he denies the allegations. Maybe they're true, maybe they're not. But $50 million, he didn't rape her, right? I think what the thing that I read is that he simulated like oral sex, like somehow he got in front of her and he gyrated his hips. It sounded like he was fully clothed at the time. So he did something rude. And, and so, you know, that was offensive. And so she sued him and she gets $50 million. I mean, this is an outrage. I mean, first of all, anybody would trade places with this woman. I mean, a guy's going to shake his hips at you and you collect $50 million. I mean, there is no proportion to the supposed suffering that the victim has and this windfall. Uh, $50 million. Yeah, where do I sign up for that? Right. I mean, I mean, I, victimize me and give me $50 million. Doesn't sound that bad. Right. If if you basically can put your place and, and say, I would rather have the money. I would rather endure. Right. That uh, that harassment and get the money. Then, you know, they're getting too much money. Right. I mean, this is all absurd. I mean, look, apparently this guy had been sued a few times and he's got a $10 million judgment, $11 million judgment against him. I don't know, whatever it was. And it seems like the guy's probably a real jerk. I mean, I'll, let's say that. Let's concede that, that this guy is an asshole and he's the, the boss from hell. Right. I still don't think you can sue him for his behavior. You know what you do if your boss is a jerk and is offensive and does stuff like, you know, uh, thrusting his, uh, you know, his his hips in front of your face. You quit your job. That's what you do. You quit. You go find another employer. That's what happens. You don't sue him. That's not what you're supposed to do. Yes. All right. Is it difficult? All right. I got to find another job, right? Because my my employer is a jerk. But you know what? If employers are jerks and all their people start quitting, they're either going to have to change their behavior and act better, right? Or they're going to have to pay up, right? You can be a jerk and ask to your employees just so long as you pay them a lot more than everybody else. And there might be a lot of people that say, you know what? My boss is a real son of a bitch, but he pays me so much money I can't quit, right? He pays me so much more than all the nice bosses that I'm willing to endure his BS because he pays me, right? Now, that's fine, but you know what? If there's a real jerk of a boss out there that has to overpay all of his workers just so they don't quit because he's such a jerk, how long is this guy going to stay in business? Right. Because his competitors who are nicer to their employees are not going to have to pay as much because they're not going to have to compensate for all that harassment. Uh, and then they're going to outcompete him and he's going to go out of business. Look, let capitalism fix this, not government, not these BS lawsuits. Nobody has a right to a job. If you don't like your job, you quit. If you don't like your boss or the way he's behaving, you quit. Now, look, yes, if, if the boss actually like pins you down and rapes you, right, or assaults you, beats you up, and you're in the hospital, he physically assaults you, sure, that's a crime, right? That's not only harassment, that's a crime, and you could go to jail. But if he just does something, right, he doesn't actually touch you, he just says something or does something that offends you, then you quit, right? That's it, right? Because people have a right to be offensive, and nobody has a right not to be offended. Now, you don't have to associate with people who are offensive. And if those people happen to be your boss, well, then you have to quit because employment is a voluntary arrangement between the employer and the employee. And the employer actually is the one that's writing the paycheck and he sets the terms of the employment. And the employee either agrees to those terms or he doesn't. So if your employer tells you, here's what I'm going to pay you, here are your hours. I'm going to change your hours whenever I feel like it. And by the way, I'm going to I'm going to be very offensive and insulting, and I'm going to say things that you probably don't like. But here's the pay package that you're going to get for putting up with all this. And if you take it, then you take it. If you don't like it, then don't work there. Go someplace else. There are plenty of people that you could work for if you're working for a jerk. But the way we have it in America, you get to sue. But the biggest problem is the chilling effect that this sends to other employers. Because why even hire women? Why even take a chance? Because what if you don't do anything wrong? 
right? Who's, maybe this guy didn't do what this woman accused him of doing, even though what he's being accused of is not even that bad. I mean, sure, it's, it's, it's boorish behavior. It's inappropriate behavior. But come on, $50 million. But maybe he didn't do anything. I mean, how do you know? Any woman can make up anything these days. And you have a jury that will believe, hey, the women have to be believed. Right. If she's the accuser, you got to believe her no matter how crazy the story is. Hey, we got to believe her because if we don't believe her, we're a sexist. So, I mean, this is really scary to hire women. And it's not just like if you're an employer and you hire a woman, it's not just that you may do something that exposes you to a lawsuit. One of your other employees may do something. And now you're on the hook for that. Or what if one of your uh, uh, female employees just falsely accuses one of your male employees of doing something? You're on the hook. Right? I think a lot of men, to be honest with you, are now afraid to work with women. Right? They're afraid to go on a business trip out of town with women. Who the hell knows what they might make up? Right? It's, it's dangerous. Right? And so by empowering all these women, making it so easy for women to sue everybody and collect big money, what we end up doing is creating a backlash, making it harder for them to find jobs. And then, of course, you know, just like you know, when the government creates unemployment you know, because of these mandates about fairness in the work week or when they do all, they make it so easy to sue your boss, right? and then all of a sudden there's all kinds of unemployment, now what happens? Oh, capitalism doesn't work. Or, oh, we need to fix capitalism. You know, I think the funniest, I read this tweet by this actor, um, Mark Ruffalo. And you know he's uh, you know he plays uh, Doctor Banner right the Hulk uh, in uh, in the Avenger movies and I forget what else he's been in but obviously he's making a lot of money and these are big box office movies so he's a multi multi millionaire gets paid a lot of money to be in movies and so he puts out this crazy tweet and it it got a lot of uh, you know action on Twitter I I didn't find out about it till much later in the day my wife actually uh, showed me the tweet and then I uh, I responded to it but. This is basically the text of his tweet. It's time for an economic revolution. Capitalism today is failing us, killing us, and robbing from our children's future, right? So you have this highly successful Hollywood actor, right? A, a main beneficiary of, uh, of capitalism, right? I mean, come on. I mean, how could this guy make anywhere near this kind of money in any other system but capital. He just play acts. He doesn't really do it. He acts in movies, and he's a multi-multi-millionaire just playing make-believe, playing dress-up, right? This is great. Look, more power to him. I don't begrudge him his success or his money, but apparently he begrudges everybody else's success and their money, right? Capitalism isn't working. Well, it worked out great for him, right? So, you know, I was uh, sending out some tweets. You know, I, I, what really what should happen is people, we should give the left some of their own medicine. Because, you know, capitalism really isn't working in Hollywood either. I mean, to be honest with you, right? I mean, if you're, if you're a real uh, a socialist, I mean, capitalism is a disaster in Hollywood. I mean, first of all, you have a tiny fraction of the actors who are A-list actors who are making millions and millions of dollars, right? The 1%, right? Ruffalo was in the 1%. He's in the top 1% of actors. But then you have all these other actors, the 99%, that are waiting tables just to make ends meet. Is that fair why should a handful of actors make millions of dollars? And then you have all these actors that are fighting for the crumbs. That's not fair at all, right? Let's redistribute all this money, right? R Mark Rufio and his buddies, you know, at the Academy Awards, these guys, they have all too much money, right? All these Hollywood elite socialists have too much money. People are making too much money in the entertainment industry. I mean, first of all, entertainment should be a right, right? It shouldn't be something that you have to buy, right? I mean, healthcare is a right. I mean, what about entertainment? I mean, you can't really live unless you're entertained. I mean, because, you know, you could get sick. You have to laugh every once in a while. It should be a human right. Nobody should make a profit off of other people's need to be entertained, right? We should have a single provider, right? We should have a government department of entertainment be in charge of all the entertainment, right? Then it could be free for everybody. Then the rich wouldn't be able to buy better tickets. I mean, how many poor people are going to Broadway plays, right? We need to let poor people have a chance at seeing a Broadway play. So let's have government produce all the plays, all the movies, all the television through a government department. It can be free, right? And then all the, the actors could just work for the government and they can be paid the same as mailmen. How about that? That would be a lot fairer. Or at a minimum, at a very minimum, even if the government's not going to do it, how about if every time a uh, production company hires an actor, they don't actually pay the actor, right? They just pay SAG, the Screen Actors Guild. So whoever it is, whether it's Leonardo DiCaprio or somebody you've never heard of, right? 
Whatever they're going to get paid, they don't get the money themselves. It just goes to SAG, right, the Screen Actors Guild. They collect all the salaries, all the money, rather, that's paid to all the members of SAG, right, because you have to be a member of SAG to be in these, in these movies. So they collect everybody's uh, paycheck. And then they divvy it up equally, right? Everybody gets their fair share. So you know one actor gets $15 million for doing a movie and some other guy just gets a couple hundred bucks or some kind of union scale. No, no, no. We take all the money into one big pot, right? And then give everybody uh, what's fair, right? To each according to his ability and then to each according to his needs. That's how we should run Hollywood. Of course, you know, SAG has to take out a big cut. So we can't really redistribute everything because we have to, you know, take out a nice slice for the bureaucracy of the SAG to give everybody their fair share. But how about doing that, right? Because capitalism is not working. You have this extreme income inequality among actors. In fact, maybe as far as professions are concerned, I don't know. I don't have the statistics, but maybe acting is the most extreme in inequality, right? I think the difference, you always talk about how much CEOs make versus how much the lower employees make and what the difference is. Well, what is the difference between what Tom Cruise is making on a movie or Will Smith and some guy, you know, that's, you know, just got one line, right? Somebody nobody's heard of, right? I mean, what about the same movie, <laughs> right? You know, and, and you could say, well, Will Smith or Tom Cruise have more words. Okay, let's pay them by the word then. Let's equal it out. Right. Let's pay them the same per word. Right. I'm sure the disparity there is probably the greatest of any of any occupation. And they also, of course, have all kinds of pay disparities among between men and women. And all that. I mean, they're complete hypocrisies. Right. Nowhere is hypocrisy greater than when coming from Hollywood. So when you see these uh, uh, these left wingers out there uh, talking about how bad capitalism and how it has to be changed. Right. Well, let's throw it right back at them and say, yes, let's start with Hollywood. Let's start with the motion picture industry. Let's change capitalism there. There's a lot too much money, too many people getting rich. So I put out a couple of good tweets. I retweeted the, the Ruffalo one, got a lot of action. So you can take a look at it and follow me on Twitter. But, you know, I want to finish up this podcast. I didn't even realize it was going to be so long. Uh, to get to this, but I want to talk about what's going on at Gold Money because it really is uh, kind of an unfortunate uh, development at Gold Money. And you know, when Gold Money first started, there was a lot of optimism there that they really could, you know, democratize gold ownership. Uh, that you know, people could really put themselves on a gold standard by using gold as money. Uh, that gold money could maybe disrupt. Uh, the uh, the monetary system, kind of the way FedEx disrupted the post office by giving people an alternative to fiat currency uh, by making it easier to use gold, not just as a store of value, which people have been using for a while, but to use it again as a medium of exchange, to use gold in commerce, right? And the whole idea is we have a platform where people can have a gold account and you can transfer your gold uh, to anybody that has an account free of charge, merchants would be able to invoice their customers in gold and receive gold, and the transactions would be cheaper than using Visa or MasterCard, that all the gold money customers would be able to get uh, debit cards where they can spend gold and, and you know at point of sale, and, and so they can save in gold, spend in gold, earn in gold. It was a great idea. Uh, I bought into the idea, although I was very skeptical at first, but then I began convinced uh, that they could do it. And I kind of backburnered my own plans to do something like that at Europe Pacific Bank because I thought incorrectly uh, that um, that gold money would be able to do it actually more efficiently than I could, that they had already achieved a greater degree of scale. And so, you know, rather than trying to do it on my own, I kind of got behind gold money's effort. Well, you know, they tried, they gave it, they gave it a college try, but unfortunately they couldn't overcome the, the regulatory cost. I mean, when I first uh, met Roy Sabag and, you know, we talked about this, uh, the costs were nowhere near uh, what they ended up being. I mean, probably they had no idea what they were in store for when they tried to compete with central banks. You know, and this is why, you know, a lot of the Bitcoin, you know, when these guys keep saying, oh, well, Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin, uh, you know, uh, is going to work as a medium of exchange, it's never going to happen. I mean, because they're not even trying to use Bitcoin as a medium of exchange. But if they did, the regulators would destroy it. But they're not because it can't even happen. I mean, which is why it's so ridiculous when people try to say that Bitcoin is a store of value, because the underlying purpose of Bitcoin originally was to be a medium of exchange, right? It's to be able to transact in Bitcoin instead of currencies or gold, right? Uh, but if you can't transact in it, then what value does it have? And if it has no value, then you can't store value when there's no value there. But anyway, getting back to gold money. So what happened was the cost, the compliance costs that were 
uh, basically laid on gold money by the regulators were so enormous that gold money was losing a ton of money on all the small accounts. They were letting people open up accounts with $50, $100, you know, $500, and charging them very, very low fees. And without the regulation, without the compliance, all of this was doable. The technology is there, right? This can actually be provided at a very low cost. The only reason that gold money can't work as far as based on what it promised is because of government regulation. That is it. That's the only thing. And I remember, you know, I, that was a concern I had initially, but I thought, you know, they had overcome that. But the problem is that the regulations were ramped up dramatically uh, on this company from when I first got involved to really destroy the business model of, uh, you know, gold really as money. Now, it doesn't mean gold money is going out of business, they're basically having to change their business model to get away from the regulatory burden that has been imposed upon them. And so what they had to do was impose a minimum storage fee on every account of $10 per month. And so by doing that, that means if you have an account at Gold Money, it's going to cost you $120 a year to maintain it. Now, of course, if you do any buying and selling in a given month, then that will offset your a 10% fee. So if you buy some gold or sell some gold and you pay a commission, there's a half a percent commission, then for that month, you probably won't have any storage fees. But for the months where you have no activity in your account, there's going to be a $10 fee. Now, if you got $50,000 worth of gold, $100,000 worth of gold, a million dollars worth of gold, which some people do, well, I mean, it's no big deal. I mean, it's actually a small price to pay. In fact, you're not even impacted because their, their regular storage fee, which is already very, very low by industry standards, is much more than $10 a month when you're talking about a million dollar account, right? So the, the, the larger account holders aren't even going to notice that there's now a $10 a month minimum because they've been paying more than that. Uh, and they're happy to do it because they're getting a good deal. But the problem is, let's say you only have $1,000 worth of gold in your gold money account, right? And you put it there because you want to, you know, you want to escape inflation. You don't want your savings to be eroded away in value in dollars or euros or whatever. So you opened up a gold money account. And you got $1,000 there. Well, if you're going to pay $10 a month, that's $120 a year, right? Well, if you only have $1,000 worth of gold, and you're paying $120 a year to store it, that's 12%. That you're, you're seeing your purchasing power eroded, not by inflation, but by the storage fees. So it really makes no economic sense for somebody with $1,000 or even really probably somebody with less than $5,000. It makes no sense to have a gold money account. You should just store the gold yourself because the cost of storing it with a third party is too high. Now, of course, before gold money came around, that's what people were doing. But they initially made it easy for people to buy $50 worth of gold, $100 worth of gold. They made it economical. The government made it uneconomical. So in order to continue to operate as a profitable business, they have to basically get rid of all the small accounts, which is what they're doing intentionally. They know that people are not going to pay $10 a month to store $50 worth of gold. I mean, after five months, you know, the gold is gone, right? Uh, and so they are deliberately trying to get the small accounts to close so that they no longer have to deal with the cost, the compliance costs. And all of this comes from anti-money laundering. All of it was emanated from the United States, even though they're regulated out of Canada. The United States ensnared everybody. This is all because of the Patriot Act, right? It's all because of Bush and all those regulations and fact and all this stuff that came in, right, where the government is now snooping on everything we do. They have to make sure that everybody who buys $50 worth of gold is not a terrorist, right? It's not laundering money. It's not a drug dealer. I mean, what's the odds that that's actually the case, right? But it costs a fortune uh, for them to do all the compliance. So, so now they've decided, look, if we don't get at least $10 a month from an account, eh, you know, it's just not, it's not worth it. We can't handle the cost economically. And I guess they're saying, look, you know, we can give much better service. And I expect the service to improve substantially at gold money for the larger accounts that can still avail themselves of the services. Uh, but it's unfortunate that the government uh, did this. Now, also, what they did is they screwed up uh, the transfers. I mean, if you if you have an account in the U.S. right now, you can't even transfer gold to another gold money account. Right? You can't even transfer it to shift gold to buy gold. You can't even transfer it to men A uh, to buy jewelry. If you're in Europe, you can still make those transfers, which is what I would recommend. Right? If you have a few thousand dollars worth of gold, 
uh, transfer it, if you're not in the United States, transfer it over to Monet and buy some jewelry. Buy it for your wife. You got the holidays coming up, you know, uh, you know, because you, you got to pull the gold out because you can't let the storage fees eat it up. So buy some beautiful Monet jewelry, 24 karat ju- gold jewelry with your small amount. Or, you know, you can, uh, you know, you can go out and buy some physical gold uh, if you want, or silver. What I would recommend too, if you have somewhere between five and ten thousand dollars worth of gold at Gold Money, uh, I would I would convert my gold to silver, because you have the same storage fee whether you store gold or silver, and based on that fee, you're getting a better deal if, if you're paying the price for the silver rather than the gold. So if you have six thousand, seven thousand, maybe convert it to silver. In which case, the storage fee is not that bad. It's still a little high, but you know, obviously, as you get over ten thousand, twenty thousand, then it doesn't matter, right? The storage fee is is very manageable. But the, the underlying problem is government regulation really destroying. Uh, what the company was hoping to be. Now, that doesn't mean that it'll never be able to do that. Maybe it'll be able to figure out these problems in the future and and find a way to overcome the regulation, or maybe the regulations will be eased back, or maybe there'll be some new technology or something that enables them to proceed. Because they're always going to have the platform. They have the vaults. They have a lot of gold. I mean, they they have a lot of stuff that they can build on. But in the meantime, uh, the whole idea of people using gold as a medium of exchange, using gold in commerce, That's really going to have to be tabled for a while. And what gold money really is, is uh, a retailer, right? It is a retailer of gold uh, and it is a storage company and silver. So you can buy gold, you can buy silver, you can still buy it online and they'll store it for you. And it's very convenient, but you need to buy larger amounts in order for the storage fees to be economical. But one uh, uh, piece of optimism out there is this dream is not going to die. Not if I have anything to say about it, because, you know, I was already working on something like this at my bank, at Euro Pacific Bank. And when I started working with uh, gold money, I kind of put all that on the back burner because I thought that, hey, gold money, again, they're going to do it. They're going to fulfill this. And so rather than uh, compete with gold money, I'll just work with gold money and let gold money uh, run with this ball. And, and build this out. Well, since they really can't do it on their platform, I'm, you know, I'm going to go full speed ahead now with my own platform. And you know, we are talking right now. I mean, hopefully by next year, you know, we will be uh, able to roll out the gold back debit card program uh, in full swing at my bank. Basically, I am also going to be uh, opening up the bank to American customers. I've already had to ramp up my compliance. I spent a lot of money on. Uh, software and stuff. And a lot of the reasons that I didn't want to have American customers when I first started my bank no longer exist. So we are going to be opening it up. Uh, You know, don't try to open up an account now if you're an American, because we're still not taking Americans. So when we do take Americans, I will announce it on this podcast. And then you can go if you want to have an account with me, you can. But as of now, don't even try because you're wasting your time because we still do not take them. But I am going to roll out the gold program. We can do it, I think, far more economically because we are a bank and the way we're planning on operating. See, gold money, you know, has everybody's account is individually segregated. It's individually stored. My bank is going to have one master account. We're going to have everybody's gold in one account, and then I'm going to individually allocate it to each bank customer. Right now, we just charge $5 a month to have an account uh, and no storage fees. So in other words, $5 a month would be your storage fee, Uh, but it'll be a full bank account, right? You'll be able to have uh, currencies in the account, multi-currencies and gold, and we will have complete uh, exchanges. I mean, any Euro Pacific bank customer will be able to transfer gold or euros or dollars in any quantity to any other uh, gold uh, a Euro Pacific uh, bank customer for free. We'll have those transfers in there. Uh, we're hopefully we're going to have we're going to be our own issuer of uh, debit and credit cards. And the way my software is currently written, and hopefully. Uh, you know, we'll get all the approvals. Nothing is a sure thing because we're still having problems, uh, you know, with banks and everything. But, you know, we are making a lot of progress and I think we're going to bring this to fruition. But the way uh, the program will ultimately work uh, once it's all uh you know, done. And we already have the software to make it happen. We just have to put uh, the other pieces in the puzzle. But the way it will work is if you have an account at Euro Pacific Bank, uh, you can have gold in your account, you can have euros in your account, you can have, uh, you know, British pounds in your account, you keep whatever you want, and then you can get a visa, you know, you get a visa card or a MasterCard, whoever we end up issuing. And then you can decide what you want your card tied to, right? One card, you could decide, do I want that card to spend 
euros? Do I want it to spend dollars or do I want it to spend gold? And then you simply, you know, go on to the website and you set your card, right? So if you set it on gold, then every time you buy something, gold will be sold to pay for it. You don't have to do anything, right? You don't have to load a prepaid card because it's not a prepaid card. You don't have to raise cash. The currency for your card will be gold. So if you have $10,000 worth of gold in your account and you set your card on gold, every time you use it, whether it's to buy something or take out a cash advance, gold will automatically be sold 24 hours a day, seven days a week at the time you use it at the market price of gold at that time, automatically uh, done. You won't have to do anything. And, and so that's the way, it's, the way it needs to be. That's the way it should be. Then you can go back into your account and you can set it on dollars. And then every time you use that card, it will spend dollars. And it won't spend any of your gold or it won't spend your euros. And so if you're going to take a vacation in Europe, right, and you have some euros in your account, switch the card to euros. Then once you switch the card to euros, it'll stay on euros until you decide to go in and change the pay on the card again, either to dollars or you can change it to gold, but it will stay wherever you leave it and all the transactions will draw from that particular monetary bucket, be it a fiat currency or gold. But anyway, my entire gold back debit card program had really, again, been on the back burner ever since uh, I got involved with gold money. Uh, in fact, you know, when gold money came around, I, I had started the program, uh, I forget, years earlier. I was still trying to, uh, you know, get the bugs out of it, get it up and running. But now uh, we're really accelerating the process uh, because since gold money can't do it, I'm going to try to do it myself. And maybe I'll be able to work uh, with a partnership with gold money. Maybe we'll be able to uh, have gold money customers. I have no idea. Maybe they'll be able to gain access uh, to my bank products, to my uh, debit cards and things like that uh, through their gold money accounts. I really don't know. I haven't, uh, I mentioned it to them, but I haven't had any real discussions. So maybe we will, maybe we won't. That would be good. Uh, I you know, like to work with them on that if we can. If we can't, it doesn't really matter because I'm going to do it anyway, because this needs to be done. And if their platform uh, wasn't able to accomplish it, uh, then I'm going to try to do it through my bank. Again, gold money is still a great place to buy gold as long as you're buying, you know, $20,000 worth, $50,000 worth. It's a, it's a great deal on storage. The money is safe. The spreads are low. The commissions are low. And, of course, if you work through Shift Gold, Shift Gold is still a part of, of gold money. And, of course, this strengthens uh, the, the balance sheet of the company. This will mean the company will be more profitable in the short run? Yes. Does it diminish its potential for growth? Of course, right? Because you, you knock out all these small customers, right? I thought they could have millions and millions of small customers all around the world. I mean, some of the people who probably most would need this service are living in poor countries. They're the unbanked. You know, now a lot of people think, oh, the solution is Bitcoin. That's not the solution at all. That just creates a bigger problem. But gold is the solution. But again, the federal the governments, the central banks don't want the free market solving this problem, right? They don't want competition just for the same reason the government didn't want competition for the post office, right? They want a monopoly. They want a monopoly in money. They want to create a, an inferior product to real money. They want people using their fiat. They want to make it harder and harder for people to use gold. Now, hopefully, maybe my bank will be able to do an end run around that. But, of course, the problem is ultimately... You know, I'm a licensed bank and I have to deal with other banks. So I'm still operating within this rig system. So it's possible that somewhere along the way, I'm going to run into the same barriers uh, that gold money ran into. And it's going to limit what I want to do. But I'm going to do as much as I can get away with uh, to make it as easy for people to opt out of fiat currencies and to have bankable gold to bank their gold, and obviously not just to spend their gold, because who would want to spend their gold? I would only spend my gold once I finished spending my dollars or my euros or my yen, right? That's Gresham's law, right? And that's going to happen. But it's going to be the merchants that are going to drive gold commerce because they're going to want to be paid in gold because ultimately it should be cheaper to be paid in gold than to transact in gold. And now you don't have to worry about inflation ravaging the proceeds of your sales, right, before you have a chance to replace your merchandise. And as this inflation starts to run out of hand, which we know it's going to, the Fed has promised more inflation, and that's one promise that it's going to deliver on. Gold is your safety hedge. Gold is your protection. 
Gold is going to be the free market solution to a government-created problem, and I'm going to try to be as big a part of that solution as I possibly can, knowing that we're fighting the government. Because the last thing the government wants is to let you escape inflation. Inflation is a tax, and they want to make sure everybody pays it. Gold is the way to avoid that tax. Thank you.